Okay, uh, so we are, uh, are about 20 minutes late, but uh, I will try to catch up. Today we have to start with lesson number three, which is plan the project. Uh, naturally, I do understand that we are a bit slow so far, and uh, we had to do lesson number three, four, and five. Uh, we have only the next week left. Uh, and lesson number six is very, very short, they're very small at the end of it. But major effort is going to be lesson three, lesson four, and lesson five. Uh, today we are doing the lesson three. Uh, so far, we have done two lessons. Uh, the first one, in which we talked about the business acumen. Second, in which we talked about the uh, you know, uh, about the team and the stakeholders, how to get them together and initiate the project. And now, once we have initiated the project, we are in the planning of the project. You remember, as, as I said, first chapter was about the business acumen. Second was related to uh, normally um, uh, the, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the, uh, the power skills. And today what we are going to talk about is more about the ways of working. In the previous lecture, we did talk about, uh, uh, in the end of it, the last topic was uh, approaches, the different approaches like predictive or agile. So we selected that approach in the initiation. Now we are proceeding ahead with it and we are going to do the planning and specifically in the areas of scope, schedule, resource, budget, risk, quality, and everything. Uh, as far as the stakeholder identification and stakeholder management is concerned and communication management is concerned, we have already covered these two topics uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, we, have, uh, we have discussed in detail how to deal with stakeholders and how to create a communication management plan. So let us move on with the remaining planning elements. Okay, so first topic is planning the projects. And as you see, um, we have any of the approaches selected. We could have selected a predictive approach or an agile approach and uh, maybe the hybrid approach. Uh, in all of these methods, we have slightly a different way of planning. So we will take take you along on each one of these paths. If you are doing a predictive project, in this naturally we have to plan everything upfront and then execute it, uh, execute the plan which has been finalized, which have been agreed, and then we monitor and control it and ultimately we close it. So that is quite sequential in a way, uh, the process groups of a predictive project could be quite a bit on sequence. I could say I initiated the project, I planned it thoroughly uh, up to the detail, and then I executed it, then monitored and controlled and ultimately closed the project. If it was a agile project, Naturally, we could not have planned everything because we do, do not know all the detailed requirement. Therefore, we have a slightly different approach. We establish a kind of a guide rails because we know, don't know all the de details. So whatever we know, we start with the, that. We try to maintain some kind of control and we allow for uh, the requirements to evolve over time while we are actually doing the work in small iterations. And as you understand, a hybrid approach would be where we have uh, uh, you know, partially predictive approach and partially agile approach and teams can tailor their way of working and act quickly and flexibly. So naturally, we are, uh, are already introduced to all of these three methods. Anyways, if we are Talking about a predictive approach, uh, we will be uh, having a detailed plan, right? In the beginning, we uh, because this, uh, the, there is a high likelihood the requirements are not very likely to change. And therefore, in a predictive project, we try to capture uh, as much detail as possible, uh, rather almost 
all the details about the project we collected from the from the customer and then we start planning things out like that in our predictive project the things which are more important to me are all the knowledge areas uh, i develop a separate management plan for scope for schedule for cost for quality for resources and so on and so forth there are 10 different knowledge areas uh, for each knowledge area i develop a management plan and then i put it all together in form of a project management plan right these uh, subsidiary plans the, I, I, as i said uh, scope management plan requirements management plan and all these are called the subsidiary plan and they actually form part of a big plan which is the project management plan so basically we are trying to create a project management plan which contains all of these subsidiary plans moreover we have certain baselines we uh, uh, the most uh, you know sensitive things in a project are sensitive areas in the project are scope time and cost out of all the 10 knowledge area scope time and cost are the basic uh, foundations of any project because uh, in olden days we used to call them the triple constraints heard about that do you understand what is a triple constraint uh, no yes kelvin no no okay well anyways that is a obsolete terminology but i am just telling you that triple constraint means that we have got uh, uh, certain constraints which affect each other if we ch bring any change in one area the other area will uh, will also have some impact for example if the scope of the project is changed uh, it may affect the time and cost these are the three basic constraints. They were they were considered the three basic constraints, and therefore they were called the uh, 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 triple constraint, right? But there is a fourth one also, which is called quality. And later PMI uh, found that th these are not only three or four constraints, but there are many constraints in a project. So they stopped calling them a iron triangle, and they realized. There are more than eight different kinds of constraints. Therefore, we do not use this terminology anymore. So if there are more than three constraints and the concept of uh, 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 concept of talent, uh, sorry, not talent, concept of triple constraint is no more there, then what is the importance of scope, time, and cause? PMI has ultimately decided that these are the three basic items without which we cannot define the objective of any project, right? Although they are also uh, part of several constraints, but that is not the major thing. Major thing is that a project cannot be defined if there is no scope, if there is no um, understanding of how much time it is going to take and how much uh, money is required for this project so without these three items we probably cannot even define the objectives of a project and therefore pmi started calling them the project objectives so classically there are three project objectives we don't call them triple constraint anymore they are three project objectives scope time and cost and uh, uh, if at all you want to consider, we can consider quality as the fourth project objective. But pr principally, quality is basically dependent on these three things and therefore uh, we don't uh, really consider it uh, in the list of the project objective. But some, uh, some people uh, uh, also like to call quality as our project objective. I hope so far I'm making some sense. Okay, so these three project objectives, the basic project objective, scope, time, and cost, when I, I formalize and establish my scope, I have to 
baseline it. I have to freeze it. I have to get it approved from the bosses of the project. And that is called the scope baseline. Similarly, when the schedule is finally established and approved by the bosses, then it is also baseline. So that is the second baseline. And the third baseline is cost. When we establish the cost of the project, again, it is approved and it also becomes a baseline. When these three baselines are, are established, the project is considered to be uh, planned. To be the planning of the project is considered to be complete. Why? Why don't we baseline other areas? I said there are 10 different areas we have to plan. Apart from the scope, time, cost, we have quality, we have resources, we have communication, we have stakeholder, we have uh, a lot many things. So uh, why is it not necessary to establish a baseline for everything? It is because uh, if, for example, if it is the planning of, for the resources, planning for resources is impacted impacted by or it can impact the scope time and cost for example if one of the scheduled um, planned resources is not available we our scope may be impacted our cost may be impacted our schedule may be impacted therefore there is no individual impact of any of the knowledge areas except for the main baselines so any one of the three baselines will be disturbed. And that means uh, baselines, when they were finalized, they must have absorbed the impact of all other knowledge areas. So we don't need to create separate baseline for every knowledge area, but we uh, will tweak the project until our scope, schedule and cost are finalized. Naturally, all other knowledge areas have impacted that. And once we are comfortable that we have got th these three baselines finalized, we consider our project to have uh, been approved. Um, uh, I mean, to have been, uh, 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 the planning has been completed. Uh, in the process of planning, while we are trying to establish our baselines and, the pl and plan other things, we may come up with a lot of documentation, a lot of artifacts would be created and those things which we create during this process, which may lead to the baseline, all those documentations are not considered part of the project management plan. And that is archived at a separate, uh, in a separate uh, place. And that is called project documents. So basically what we are talking about that in, in, a, uh, in a predictive project, we have got two boxes, one box is called the project management plan and other box is called the project documents. For example, you create a work breakdown structure in this process. You create a list of activities. You create a lot many documents while you know you are trying to establish a schedule. You create a network diagram. You create a GAN chart. You create a lot many documentations. All those documentation will be part of the project documents. Whereas the final shape of the baselines, the scope baseline, the schedule baseline, the cost baseline, and all the management plans are part of project management plan. I hope you can now differentiate between a project management plan and project documents. Yes, Fatma. Am I eligible to you? Yeah. Sorry, what was that? I, I was saying, can you now make a difference between a project management plan and the project documents? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, 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 okay, let me move on with the slides and I will probably explain it. This is project documents, right? What are project documents? Anything and everything we uh, we uh, um, uh, we, um, we create during the project management planning, which could be leading to the project management plan, 
all the documentation, that documentation is called the project documents, right? And naturally, I create, for example, uh, I create a scope and then uh, I develop our work breakdown structure. And then uh, when I have the work breakdown structure completed and I reach certain kind of work packages, I break them further into activities. Those activities are estimated for time, for cost and things like that. So a lot many documentation is generated while we are doing the planning work of the project. And all these documentations are subsequently building up to a final baseline, right? Baselines, there are three, scope, time, and cost. These baselines will form part of my project management plan, but all other documentation which was leading to the baseline were not considered part of the project management plan. They are considered as project documents, right? Kelvin? Is it confusing? Oh. Are you comfortable with the idea? Yes. Okay. So some documents are project artifacts which need to be maintained and then archived at the end of the project. These documentation which we create, these artifacts we create, which actually help us reach a conclusion, uh, which is the final project management plan, these artifacts are very helpful to us, and uh, but they are not par considered part of the project management plan, but they are important because they, whenever we revise anything, when whenever we update anything in the project, these artifacts will be updated and they are very helpful and we need to refer back to them. So they are in a separate place. They are placed as project document and we may be consulting them as well. But as far as the work of the project is concerned, when we are executing the project, when we are monitoring and controlling the project, we are not basically looking at the artifact, but at the final baselines and the management plan, right? So as I said, these project documents are not part of the project management plan. They are part of a separate archive and these artifacts are called as project documents. So far, so good. And remember what I am talking here is about what? Is about the predictive method of project management. It is all about predictive what I am talking right now. Okay, so formally, these could be various types of documents which could include in the project document, right? So look at a very long list. During our planning, we'll come up with the basis of various kinds of estimates. We could come up with the uh, attributes of each activity we identify. We create an activity list. We have certain assumptions that they are recorded in a separate document called assumption log. Where, uh, where we do also have a record of all the changes which is called a change log. Cost estimates are established. Cost forecasts are done. All these different documents, there are uh, around 33 different documents. All of them are just considered the project documents, right? But based on all these uh, documents, which will be created in kind of a uh, sequence or in a pattern, they will result in some kind of final, uh, you know, uh, shape for the scope, for the time and for the cost, those final shapes, which we have finally concluded that this is the total scope of the project. This is the final schedule of the project. And this is the total uh, cost estimate. And we can determine a, a, a project budget with that. These three things are the final shapes of all of this planning, which we call the baselines. So because there are three project objectives, we have got three baselines. Sch scope baseline, schedule baseline, and cost baseline. And to execute the project, we need not get into each one of these artifacts in the project document, but the baselines are, are, uh, are basically to be followed. 
we have to just accomplish the things by following the schedule which has been finally established we have to uh, spend the money on the project as per the project budget which has been established in the cost baseline and we have to fulfill the final shape of product scope and the project scope that would be in the scope baseline so as far as, as as execution is concerned project documents are no more important we just have to uh, uh, ensure that the final shapes of scope time and cost which were called the baseline are being followed are you okay with that something that is not mentioned there uh, suhail is like a project management plan can lead to another mm -hmm. management plans for example design management uh, plan exactly. quality management plan they yes. are subsidiary of the management plan the project exactly management plan. exactly exactly Actually, project management plan is the grand plan for the project. Yeah, it's, it's and the umbrella it, one. it consists of many other management plans, right? It has the scope management plan, it's a schedule management plan, a cost management plan, and so on and so forth. There are about 10 different kinds of management plans, which the project management plan is made up of. And put if we put them all together, if we integrate all those management plans and all the baselines, we come up with the final shape of the project management plan. Mm -hmm. So basically, project management plan includes two kind of things. Number one, all the management plans. And number two, all the baselines. What are all the management plans? I will describe that. But what are the baselines? We are very sure about it. There are only three baselines because there are only three project objectives. And what are they? Scope time and cost that's all yeah. right if we can so follow, in that case, in that case will be the planning the budget and the quality what would be the quality qual actually, the scope? actually ah, the scope should be the specifications kind of exactly exactly as far as the quality is concerned we do consider the quality as one of the objectives as you can call it the fourth objective but quality doesn't have a baseline why because quality is dependent on the scope schedule and cost and therefore if i am fulfilling the scope time and cost quality comes automatically with it right so there is no need to have a separate baseline for quality because quality is kind of a standard is kind of a policy which we we will anyways be following so basically when we establish the scope we have included that portion of quality within the scope within the schedule within the cost so that that is included right so that is exactly why i am not having a baseline for quality and for that matter for other knowledge areas like you know we don't have a baseline for resources we do not have a baseline for communication we do not have a baseline for stakeholders uh, for procurement for so many other areas so all the all the management plans do not form part of the baseline baseline is just scope time and cost right okay if you are clear about the project documents uh, let us move on uh, with the, the uh, with the adoptive thing but even before i can go on to adoptive or uh, <clears throat> or a hybrid approach let me explain one more one more thing and that is uh, what is the difference between a management plan and our detailed plan is there a difference between a management plan and a detailed plan for I would say yes, management your management will be a very high level you know information and detailed one is mm -hmm. specifically is is focused on one specific uh, okay. object uh okay but uh, if i say there is a scope management plan. What does that mean? Is a high level thing or for the scope? I'm not talking about the project management plan. I say there are 10 different management plans which actually mm -hmm. add up to become a project management plan. That means every area has a management plan. What is the difference between a management plan and a plan? Are they different 
or they are the same terms? I feel like it's still a high level uh, information, the, the management plan. Okay, I, I tend to agree with you, but let us take the view from Fatma. Fatma, what um, do you understand? Yep. Management plan, I think um, it's um, there <clears throat> like, you know, the whole scope time and all the my project objectives is going to be uh, negotiated with the stakeholder and uh, it's a reflection of stakeholder or like, you know, the owner uh, uh, um, idea. Okay. Uh, but, then but the plan... You are mostly talking about uh, the scope then. You are talking about the scope and probably you are referring to the scope management plan. Right? Okay. What, about, what yeah. about other management plans? You are not describing the uh, all the management plans. So basically... Uh, if you have to define the management plan, it is something like Kelvin has said that this is something like an outline, right? It is not a mm -hmm. detail. It is not a detail. Like, okay, like you know, project management plan is talking about all the um, overall components of the projects. Uh, and like, you yes, know, yes. I would is... say not the components, but all the areas in which we have to plan, right? All the yeah, like areas. you know. Yeah, like, you know, purpose and objective and all the responsibilities, like, you know, process, procedure, okay, tool and okay. techniques. Very good, very good. So you touched upon the right thing. As Kelvin said, that, plan, that uh, the management plan is not the detailed plan, right? Management plan is just the, uh, you know, summary of the plan or guideline for the plan. And now, Fatma, you have said, these are the policies, procedures, rules, regulations, and, you know, these are the generic rules or policies or procedures about that plan. How, and basically, this is describing how am I going to manage that specific area? So there is there are certain guidelines we need to establish before we start doing the work of the scope. So that would be included in scope management plan. Uh, all the uh, guidelines, how to establish a scope, how to develop a product scope, product scope. This guideline might be coming from the organization. It might be coming from the customer. It could be coming from anywhere. But those guidelines are first established. And then based on those guidelines, we start developing the details of that plan. So detailed, uh, a management plan is not the detailed plan. Management plan is uh, establishing a set of guidelines to plan that uh, that plan. So uh, uh, for scope, I, I need to first de develop some kind of principles, guidelines, uh, based on which I will be actually uh, developing the details, right? Those guidelines are called the management plan. And then we have other uh, details established. And actually those details uh, will keep becoming the part of the project documents until we reach the final shape of the scope and final sh shape of uh, any of the project objectives like scope, time and cost, they will be very important to us and we will uh, include them separately as part of our project management plan and we call them the final shape the the uh, project management plan no no, no. Uh, they i i mean they are part of the project management plan just look here they are called the baselines right there are three project objectives scope time and cost yeah each one of them when finalized that means everything in the project has been encapsulated and these three things are the three baselines they, if I have these three baselines established, I can get into the execution of the project. My planning is complete. Right? So we have a management plan uh, for every area, we, yeah. which are called the subsidiary plans. There are 10 different subsidiary plans. They, when they are complete and the baselines, three baselines are complete, our project management plan is complete. Right? There could be 
uh, a bit of other documents also which could be included in addition to the subsidiary plan like you know we could have a separate uh, uh, plan like a change management plan or a configuration management plan or the approach we have selected or the mechanism for you know establishing that so those documents are additional component so all the subsidiary plans 10 subsidiary plans three baselines and a couple of additional component they actually make up the project management plan right but then there is the detail how the things are to happen the details where how the things are to happen are all in the baselines and all the guidelines about each knowledge area they are in the subsidiary plans which we call the management plans right and if there are any additional plan which are not part of the basic 10 components then they are like change management plan the the, the configuration management plan the uh, uh, life cycle and approaches and things like that they would be considered as additional component so a project management plan uh, is completed when all of these things are completed all the management plans all the baselines and all the other plans right this is called the project management plan and i did tell you that everything which we created in the process of developing this project management plan which were subsidiary documentations which one document led to another that led to another and yet ultimately we were able to establish those three baselines all these documents are important to us but they are not considered part of project management plan but they are considered project documents they are separate archive project document is a separate box project management plan is a separate box are you comfortable with the idea alexandra okay yes it's very clear <clears throat> okay if you're if you're really comfortable with the idea i can move on right okay let's leave it here because that's what the predictive planning was now let us talk about the adoptive and hybrid method in adaptive, we don't need to plan everything up front. Why? Because we do not even know all the requirements as yet. Agreed? So, in, in an adaptive approach, we are more product-oriented rather than the work-oriented or scope-oriented. We are more product-oriented and we are so, uh, uh, product looks so important to us in in a uh, in a adaptive environment that we, the in charge of the project the big big guy in the project is the product owner product owner is responsible for all the requirement interestingly and those requirements are yet not final and still we want to go on with it naturally the uh, custodian of all the requirements would be the product owner so in a way, you can consider this an equivalent role to the, to the pro project sponsor. In Agile, we have product owner in place of the project sponsor. Project sponsor had a different kind of responsibility. He just had to initiate the project. He just had to nominate the project manager. And then he has to be available to provide him any, uh, you know, uh, authorizations, uh, orders or approvals but product owner has more intimate involvement in the work of the project rather i would say not the work of the project but in the in the establishment of requirements right so product owner is in charge of the requirement he can keep in touch with the customer all the time and trying to collect the uh, the needs and requirements of the customer on a continuous basis and customer can come up with new requirements at any point in the life of a project and product owner will entertain the customer. So uh, the requirements are not finalized. Before we start the project, uh, Agile project, uh, we may have partial requirements ready so we can start working with it. So uh, we cannot develop a, a detailed plan because we don't know all the requirements. 
I hope you understand how am I differentiating a, a agile project from a predictive project. Do we understand that? So product owner decides the objectives according to the customer needs and want, which are continuously changing. And we are being so agile, so flexible that we convert our planning on the go. We can keep changing the direction of the plan as per the requirements of the customer because the uh, you know custodian of all the requirements is the product owner and customer is keep is uh, it keeps changing the requirement in the product backlog while the team is just focusing on a small portion of the project which we call an iteration and they are just working on that they are not concerned if the other requirements are being changed right so they are allowed to change whereas only the requirements which we are working on in one iteration and you know our iteration could be one to four weeks so if your iteration is two weeks long and you have picked up 10 items to do in that iteration we just try to freeze that we say nobody can change these 10 requirements while we are doing them while in this process the customer is free to change any other requirement which we have yet not started do you agree with me so we have a kind of a safety net the team which is working on certain number of requirements, only the couple of them, only they are frozen. Otherwise, all other requirements which are yet to come and which are to be changed by the customer, that is free for change. They can always and any time change them and product owner is there to accommodate all the needs and requirements of the customer. While the team is working on a small portion of work which is called an iteration and we have requested that these 10 items or 20 items which we are currently doing which we have been permitted by the product owner to start working on may not be changed while we are working on them we are just asking for this much uh, you know restriction right and once we deliver those items then we move back to the product backlog see what all new requirements have been added there we prioritize everything and again once they are in a order of priority then team selects another couple of items for the next iteration so that way iteration by iteration we keep performing until all the requirements of the project can be completed so we probably cannot say how much time this project is going to take it is it may take forever to complete the project or it may uh, finish early this all depends on the changing nature of the requirement when the customer says all is well i don't need any more things to be done the project can be closed after that right i hope i'm not confusing you too much so that is the product owner role how the requirements are changing and he is accommodating. On the other hand, the team members are the team. They are the local domain experts. We said they are generalizing specialists. They are T-shaped people. They are self-organizing. So uh, they are actually responsible for doing the work. And what work are they doing? They are only doing the work which they have picked up for uh, working on in one iteration, right? And once they pick up some certain items from the product backlog, they bring them to their iteration and they put it in their own iteration backlog or sprint backlog. And they just concentrate on doing that job. By the end of these two weeks, they hopefully will be able to complete all those user stories or maybe part of them. But we don't mind if they, they are not able to complete all the stories user stories they have picked up from the product backlog initially maybe they picked up 10 items and they could do only eight uh, we we don't blame them for that because they actually did not know how much time it will take or how much uh, you know in uh, effort this will take so they have done uh, an approximation they claim that okay we probably will be able to do these 10 requirements 
but naturally while doing this iteration they understand that they could only complete eight so those eight user stories which are completed will be delivered to the customer the two which were incomplete will be submitted back to the product backlog this is also possible that this team uh, uh, thought they can, they could do 10 user stories but they end up doing more right because the iteration size is fixed say we have got two weeks to do uh, whatever the jobs we uh, we are trying to do and those 10 items which we picked in the beginning we are able to complete them in one week so what do we do for the remaining week normally people say okay we can close the iteration sorry we cannot close the iteration iteration is fixed in size it will end after two weeks right but we have spent only one week and we did all the job we picked up so what we can do is we can go back to the product by backlog immediately and we can pick more work we can we will keep doing work until the iteration is time is complete until the two weeks are complete so we may end up completing 15 or 20 requirement that means we have done more than what we initially thought we could do right so this is very much possible that the target you have selected for uh, for doing within this iteration uh, we could exceed that or we could uh, we, we could not complete all of it we could complete some of it so whatever we could complete whether more or less whatever we we have accomplished will be presented demonstrated and to the customer and customer will uh, kind of uh, do the acceptance criteria and if they are up to the mark up to the requirements of the customer they will be considered approved that these jobs are done and then we can move on to the next iteration and the next iteration and that way we will be uh, slowly and steadily moving towards the completion of the project but the interesting part of all of this story is that because when we were picking the work for an iteration we had picked the highest priority items and i did give you the 80 20 rule in which i said that 80 20 percent of the job when that is done you might have achieved 80 percent of the overall value right so maybe the customer starts considering that okay we just have three iterations completed but we have got 80 percent of the project is is over because the value expected from this project 80 percent of the value has been achieved in just three weeks so now we are as far as the value is concerned we are only 20 percent more value to achieve right which is in the remaining 80 percent requirement so why should we do all the 80 percent requirement maybe uh, out of those 80 percent requirement if you can handle the most high highly prioritized item maybe we can reach the level of 98 percent 99 percent probably that could be sufficient we don't want to waste our money on those uh, those tasks or those requirements which are least important to us so probably uh, they can drop additional or unnecessary requirements and close the project there and then this is all the decision of the customer so that is a fun we have in an agile project and we can even end up doing the project in half the time or even less time apparently it looks like that agile project is, uh, is something like a loop it is never going to end right customer can keep adding the requirement and we can uh, go on and on forever but you see <clears throat> customer has to pay for that as well we are charging them for every iteration so if they uh, start getting uh, infinite work from us they never stop then probably they have uh, they have to spend infinite money on that as well so that is the fun in the in the agile contract that we are paid based on what we deliver right so if we uh, the customer keeps asking us to do more more and more we'll be paid more more and more i hope you understand the point in it 
just because the customer was not sure what all things are to be done. He got into an agile contract with us. And in an agile contract, we said, okay, uh, uh, for each iteration, we will charge you $5,000, right? And uh, uh, we are not trying to elongate the project. We are trying to do the highest value items the first. And as soon as customers, uh, we move ahead with their iteration, customer starts getting satisfied. And as soon as he has ample satisfaction, they can say, okay, I think we have, uh, we have all the value we wanted and we do not need any more iterations. We do not need to pay any further for this project. So let us call quits. Let us close the project. I hope you get the idea. Kelvin is just like a contract project. Like you see, okay, we are charging you for maybe uh, on hourly basis or daily basis, per time charges, right? And whatever work you want us to do, we will do it and you will pay us on the weekly basis, right? I feel okay. I feel like uh, the adaptive uh, approach is mostly oriented to operational or maintenance kind of work. Exactly, exactly. Because... Uh, That's something they, that you know that never stops. Yeah, and, yeah. And continuity, yeah. continuity, continuous nature of work evolving is like uh -huh. i i agree with you that looks something like uh, operation but because yes. this is a unique work and this is evolving and the requirements are evolving so we call it agile mm -hmm. right there are one time requirement naturally the requirement we have completed we are not going to do it again so it is not exactly an operation but you are right in saying that it is something which looks like an operation which keeps changing right okay and um, as we, we understand, the hybrid would be uh, having some characteristics of predictive and some characteristics of agile. Maybe the people sitting up there, maybe they are more oriented towards the predictive approach and they do want a project management plan, a contract and this and that. But on the other hand, the, the team at the lowest level may be agile. So this may, uh, may be a hybrid project in which both things are partially possible. So we are uh, we are okay with the uh, bo both uh, three types of approaches. Any doubts anywhere? Okay, so if you want to see a comparison, this is what the comparison is. The requirement specification in a predictive project could be defined in a specific terms before development, meaning we want all the requirements very well explained and well defined in the beginning of the project and we do not uh, you know uh, entertain requirements in the future when the requirements have been finalized we'll block them and we'll say no more requirement but if at all customer has any new requirement there is a very difficult way of processing that change and adding it into the project because we understand that if we change anything, if we add any new requirement, whole of our plan, which we have already finalized, may have to be revised. So a lot of work is involved in a predictive project to change anything. Therefore, we resist change in a way. We make a very uh, you know, uh, difficult process, very autocratic process for change mechanism. And therefore, change is not really very welcome in a predictive project. Whereas in an adaptive project, we, we are free to change anything anytime because we are completely working in a different approach, in an iterative approach. So we rather, uh, you know, uh, advocate elaborated frequently during the delivery. The requirements can keep pouring in while the project is going on. And hybrid is again uh, partially, you know, we can elaborate some details and some details can keep coming in. So that could be a hybrid approach. As far as the outcome is concerned, uh, in a predictive project, generally the final product is the outcome and that comes at the end of the project. Whereas in Agile, we deliver some value after every iteration. So that's why 
we there is a concept of continuous uh, delivery continuous value delivery hybrid uh, can enjoy both uh, both we can be delivering some some things incrementally we can freeze something uh, as as far as, as part of the overall requirements change is very restrictive very constrained in a predictive project and change is completely open in an adaptive project and again hybrid could be somewhere in between stakeholder involvement uh, is only partial we can engage our involved stakeholders only at certain milestones where we have to show them what we are doing and things like that but that is not really very reg regular whereas in adaptive project for every user story for every requirement we are continuously in touch with the customer they they will accept the criteria for every user story every requirement would be would be checked and approved on the run by the by the customer so the <coughs> involvement with the customer uh, is continuous in a agile project and in a hybrid project if it is not really continuous then it is quite regular as far risk and cost controls are concerned uh, we do exercise them in a predictive project through detailed planning of mostly known considerations naturally we have planned everything up front we have considered about all the risks and all the cost controls of the project right in, at the time of planning right although we can keep doing that later as well but the major part of this has been done in the beginning in a, for a agile project uh, risk and cost they are being elaborated on iterative basis when we start an iteration we have got say 10 jobs to do in that iteration we will consider the risk and cost estimation and all that uh, during that iteration right so it is simple it is easy because we are not considering uh, the risk and cost of whole of the project we are just considering the risk and cost of those tasks we need to do in this iteration so that way the burden is less and we can work more concentratedly on a, in an adaptive project and in a hybrid project we could again enjoy the best of both worlds and we could keep moving ahead with our plan in a progressive elaboration fashion <clears throat> i hope this does describe the difference between the three approaches we have been talking about okay any questions so far how comfortable are you with whatever you have learned so far okay some questions for you uh, we have studied a lot many things so far so uh, you do have a concept of a progressive elaboration do you do you not what is a progressive elaboration the plan which evolves over time right well this does happen even in a predictive project but progressive elaboration is more pronounced in an agile project although uh, uh, even in a predictive project uh, we could have planned everything but you know new requirements may arise although we have got a very strict change control mechanism but we still have to allow some changes to pass through and that means the plan will have to be re-evaluated re-elaborated so this is a process of progress elabor uh, progressive elaboration which is more pronounced in an agile project but it also does happen in a predictive project anyways the question is early in the establishment of a project the project manager spends time looking for historical data that might be helpful in planning the new project project manager is looking for examples of project documents for similar completed projects that may be used as templates for the new project in addition the project manager is also looking for information about established processes and procedures that will help the project run more smoothly what is the 
term used to define those, these documents. So we have referred to a lot many documents here, like, you know what, like project documents uh, of earlier projects, completed projects, uh, like the templates we used earlier in the previous, uh, previous project. So uh, like the processes and procedures which had been followed in the earlier projects. So uh, what are we referring to? Are we referring to organizational process assets, enterprise environmental factors, progressive elaboration, or organizational project management? What are these documents called? Um, they're OPAs. They are OPAs. Very good. Because organizational process assets is a historical data uh, held with the organization. Uh, your project, whatever you do, your lessons learned will also be recorded there and future projects will, uh, will seek help from there. They will get guidance from what you left for them. Similarly, the earlier projects which were done before you, uh, they left out certain documents, templates and other things and you uh, uh, OPAs are basically holding that information which you can use. Moreover, the policies, the procedures, the rules, the regulations, all those things are also part of OPAs. So all of these things which are mentioned here, uh, processes, processes, procedures, past data, um, and so on, templates, these all are called OPAs and they are not enterprise environmental factors because OPAs are essentially documents. Enterprise environmental factors are situations, environmental positioning. So they are not document, they are not essentially documents. They are factors which are affecting project uh, uh, or the organization internally or externally. Progressive elaboration, it is not. OPM, it is not. So basically, the answer is OPAs. So I have I am done with the first topic. Uh, uh, next, we uh, start with scope. But if you like, I can have a break for five minutes because uh, although we started late, but we need to uh, stop for a while. Is it all right with you? Let us let us have a break for five minutes and I will be back after five minutes. Take care.
Okay, I'm back. Right. So we start with scope. You see, when we start a project, especially a predictive project, we have to first establish all the requirements, right? Because in a predictive project, we have to plan everything upfront. So we need to know all the requirements of the project, like in a construction project, which usually we do in a predictive manner. First, we say, tell us what to build. We, we go for the detailed designs, drawings, everything. We need to have all the requirement up front. So collecting all that requirement is basically uh, leading to the scope. So basically, I would divide the scope in two parts. First is the requirement collection and management. And then is the product scope and project scope, right? So generally, we will encompass all of these things, the requirement gathering and establishing the product scope and then converting that product scope into the project scope. This all is generally considered as one area and it is called scoping, right? And naturally, for this knowledge area, this uh, uh, scope knowledge area, we will have to develop a generic scope management plan. But the generic doesn't mean that this management plan is prepared already and for all the projects and we are just applying it to every project. It is not like that. For every project, we will establish a separate scope management plan which will be relevant to the requirements and needs of that project. So although these are the basic guidelines, procedures, rules, regulations, how are, are we going to do the scope management? So we establish the rules for every project and those rules are called the scope management plan. But as I said, that in the area of scope, we are not only talking about the product scope and the project scope, but we are first establishing the requirement. So if you can somehow break it down into two parts, then this scope knowledge area is actually dealing with two types of management plans. And one is the requirements management plan. First, the requirements are to be established and based on those requirements, then we get into the actual scope management, which is again having two parts, the product scope. And once we know the product scope of the product, then we can establish the scope of the work. That would be the project scope. Scope of the work is in the project scope. Scope of the product, that is what we are going to create. So basically, product scope is what to create and project scope is how to create, right? But before we can start saying what to produce, what to, what to create or how to create, first we must know what all is in the requirement. So for that, we need to have requirements. So requirements have to be established. And once they are established, then we develop the product scope. And once the product scope is established, then we develop the project scope, right? All of these three areas, the requirements, the product scope and project scope, they are actually part of scope management. So we develop, uh, as I said, two management plans in scope. First is the requirement management plan. Based on that, then we develop the scope management plan. I hope you understand my point. What is the difference between scope, project scope and the product scope? Fatima? Yes, I can understand it. Yes, please. But like, you know, I tell you? Alexandra, what, what do you understand from what I, I just said? Um, the project, product scope is more specific, whereas the project scope do is... Do you like understand? A... Go ahead. Do you understand uh, how requirements are going to impact the product scope? and how product scope can be translated into project scope. Do you have 
a clear understanding of what I just explained, Alexandra? I believe I do. Can't hear you. Is is your are your mics open? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Am I do you do you want me to explain it again? Oh, sorry. My fault. I am not wearing my headphones and that's why I can't hear you, what you are saying. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good, good. So, Alexandra, uh, are you getting what I just explained to you? Yes. Good, good. Fatma, are you comfortable with it? Kelvin? All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, you remember I did mention a case study, which we would be referring during our course, but you know... Uh, that case study is very interesting. That is uh, the Shopee Lifestyle Center. Um, so let us look at the scope, product scope and the project scope of that thing and see what was fixed and what was flexible. On the right hand side, you can see these tabs, uh, the product scope and project scope and all that. So let's see what they are. Uh, just a moment. So what is the project scope of the Shopee Lifestyle Center? You remember this is a project we are trying to develop in Oasis Town and it is a tradition, it is a historic place, right? And it is very green area. Here we are trying to establish a lifestyle center which is not only going to be used for commercial purposes but also for residential purposes, right? So we are trying to, you know, inhabit that area without disturbing the environment because this is a historical area and not only the historical area, but we are also going to conserve the nature, conserve the history and conserve the nature while we develop a shopping center here, which could be, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, a commercial as well as residential place, right? That That is what it is. So what is the scope of this project? The project scope, that is what all is to be done. Basically, project scope should precede the product scope, but first we are talking about what we need to do. Project scope of Shopee Lifestyle Center is to complete a construction project and engage a sales and marketing project to fill it with the tenants over time. So the uh, residents and the tenants of that, whatever we are building, the residential area and the commercial area, they have to be mobilized. So that is within our project scope. But then what was the product scope? Product scope is the completed revitalization of Oasis Town with bespoke, that is customized spaces for commercial and community tenants, right? So we want to establish a, a environment in which there is a commercial area, the market area, and also some of the residential area. And we not only want to establish it on a sustainable basis, that we, we want people to, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, it should be commercial. It should be, you know, kind of paying for for its uh, itself. That project in, is going to pay for itself. You know, we will earn money from the commercial spaces and people would be living in the residential area. Residential area, people will be benefited from the commercial. And somehow, this is what the scope of the product is like, right? Based on that product scope, once we understand the product scope, we develop the scope of the project. So before I can develop the product scope or the project scope, I must have all the requirements clearly defined. And what kind of a project Shopee is? Is it a predictive project? Is it an agile project? Or is it a hybrid project? We have said, we have you know mentioned that a lot many times. So what kind of a project is Shopee? Yes, please. Yeah, it's kind of uh, sorry, ladies first. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Calvin. It looks like a hybrid mm. because it's, it shows something like a construction, but you know, over the time, yep. like a never stop. Very good, very good. So that part, the construction part of it, is predictive, but the uh, the, uh, the I mean, the sustainability part of it the populated tenants and all that, that part of it could be 
dealt in an agile manner. So overall, this project is has been categorized as a hybrid project, right? Yeah. So this is an environment of a hybrid project. And this is a very good example that how can a construction project be, um, you know, partially agile or something like that. So yes, it is possible. Then we have got some fixed and some flexible. Uh, some uh, some scope is fixed and some is flexible. So the portion of the scope that is fixed, that could be done only with, through a predictive manner. And that is the scope of the construction project is fixed. It's based on finalized blueprints and building compliance requirements with little room for change and a specific timeline. So this is a very clear definition of a predictive project. So the fixed scope is being handled in a predictive manner, whereas the flexible scope, what is that? That is sales and marketing project. Now the part two of the project where we have to sell these places, where we have to uh, you know, um, uh, start earning money out of, out of it, the sustainability part of it, that needs to be flexible because the conditions may change, right? So based on that, we could uh, deal with it in an agile manner. It depends on the timely completion of the construction project, naturally, market forces, and the customer's desired design. The team will derive as much value as possible, as early as possible, by working iteratively and incrementally. So here we are doing it agile. So on top, the first part of the project is fixed, or predictive, and the final part of the project is flexible or agile. So overall, this project can be termed as a hybrid project. I hope you now understand uh, what is a project scope, what is a product scope, what are fixed requirements, what are flexible requirements. Probably this could have made the things much easier for you. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about the terms we might have referred earlier. We might have talked about progressive elaboration. Maybe we might have mentioned the term roll, rolling wave planning. Uh, um, uh, in, in today's agile world, uh, these two term, terms are usually you know, uh, uh, used interchangeably. They mean uh, that the meaning is quite similar, but their application is slightly different. Uh, in Agile, it is very difficult to differentiate between these two terms. But when we talk about a predictive project, I can very clearly define what is progressive elaboration and what is rolling wave planning. Let me first tell you what are these terms. It says no matter how uh, you know predictive your project is, but you cannot be certain about everything. You can't say that whatever requirements have been given to me, they were correct and they are never ever going to change. There might be a chance and even in a predictive project, you understand that uh, there could be changes. There could be changes. Although we are very hard on, the, on those changes, we don't approve every change. Every change has to go through a very comprehensive uh, process of change management. A change mechanism is very difficult and only those changes which pass through that litmus test will ultimately be approved and the plans will be amended accordingly. But we cannot uh, oversee, we cannot, you know, uh, ignore this fact that whatever requirements we have gathered, no matter how fixed, they have a likelihood of changing. There are a lot many uncertainties in the project which could not have been planned. And then there are a lot of risks in the project which we could not have anticipated. So to, so to accommodate for that, we resort to progressive elaboration. Like I am doing a predictive project. I say I will do this project. Maybe, you know, you are trying to uh, construct a tunnel, which is a very uh, large project and maybe it is going to take 10 years. So uh, yes, objective is very clear. We have to dig a tunnel of 10 kilometer long and maybe it is going to take 10 years. So um, uh, can you go into the detail of everything? Do you, uh, you might have done, done the geographic, uh, 
geological analysis and uh, you know ground tests and everything but you do not exactly know what kind of rock is going to be there in the middle of the tunnel right uh, you could appreciate you could kind of plan okay we could have this kind of rock due to the analysis and whatever the stat satellite imagery or historical data is concerned but what is hidden in the mountain you actually do not know and when you are you are you know kind of you reach that place you may face that problem then you could come up with a detailed plan to to deal with that so we cannot plan everything up front although we try our level best to create a very comprehensive predictive plan but uh, we have to elaborate progressively when we face that specific situation and a new uh, need or requirement arises at that point we further elaborate on on our requirement and ultimately request for change in plans this i am doing in a predictive project so this elaboration is progressive as we keep traveling uh, inside the tunnel as we do kilometer 1 till kilometer 2 new facts will be realized uh, progressively we will learn new things about the tunnel and we may have to revise our plans accordingly we have to reelaborate ourselves according to the progressive movement of the project so at the strategic level i say i am going to do this tunnel in five phases first 2 kilometers will be my phase 1 second 2 kilometer will be my phase 2 and so on and so forth because i am not uh, i am i may be very clear through my analysis that the first 2 kilometers uh, uh, is this kind of rock and probably we will do things like this right so i plan my first phase in quite a bit of detail but um i know what to do in the second phase but i do not elaborate it now i leave that plan to be refined after phase 1 has finished new data has arrived we have learned new lessons and based on that i say i will create a detailed plan for phase 2 after phase 1 has been completed that is called progressive elaboration where i am elaborating my plan on phase by phase basis uh, like this is more strategic in nature right you know uh, i had the whole plan and i have divided into major chunks and i am planning things the first chunk quite bit quite a bit in detail but not others as of now as we ne get nearer to the next chunk next phase we will elaborate for it further based on the current facts which have just been revealed right so at a strategic level uh, learning and elaborating progressively over time is called a progressive elaboration same concept but, uh, but in yeah. that but in that concept there's no time constraint if i would say correct uh actually there is because we are dealing with a predictive project so we have a time constraint of say 10 years this project has to tunnel has to be ready right and the total my, 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 my question is because if it's a predictive uh, project so and you are somehow expecting to build a sequence exactly. by you know chunks exactly uh, you may face a kind of you know uh, difficult situation in which you don't proportion or you don't demand dimension your resources exactly Acor uh, i mean according to the type of or the scope of every chunk that you're talking yeah. so for example you may be you know running short on resources in the second phase considering that you were expecting to use the minimum amount i don't know it's a matter of it's, yeah, it's kind right. of risky risky approach it is it is but it is kind of uh, um, uh, like you know uh, you you do test the waters and then move ahead you, you cannot plan the whole thing well even if you plan the whole tunnel but you do not um, uh, just ignore that uh, the, uh, the 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 second phase of the tunnel is going to be exactly like the first phase it's not exactly like the same first phase maybe the stone is harder there maybe we need more drilling machine there but we could not have uh, foreseen that 
uh, right in the beginning of the project. So when we have dug first two kilometers and we have been revealed with more facts and figures, we, we can elaborate the next phase of two kilometers in a bit more detail. That is what is called progressive elaboration. We are planning in chunks. Although, because my uh, all, my tunnel is 10, 10 kilometers long, every phase is two kilometers. So whatever is my estimate for the first phase, I can simply multiply it by five and I could have a fair estimate that, okay, this tunnel might cost this much. Based on that, I got my budget. But as I move to the second phase, we understand that, okay, this is very difficult to dig it out. Maybe this phase is going to cost me double because uh, maybe we have, we need to have um, a special machinery to excavate it and things like that. There is a lot of drilling to be done. So maybe it, this is your progressive elaboration, which you will do at the phase two. And uh, uh, this could be covered as, as a project risk. This could be considered as a project risk. Although you planned the whole tunnel, but you did not un understand at that point that this thing can occur. Now, when you're doing the project, you could have uh, anticipated a risk which has now occurred and now you have to deal with it. And therefore, you may have to spend extra money. You have to have reserves and contingencies available. That is how you do your predictive project management. So far, right. so good. Yeah. Okay, let me now introduce you to the rolling wave planning. Uh, in your phase one, you said, okay, we will do the first phase of this tunnel and we uh, elaborated it to quite a bit of detail. We planned everything in detail for phase one, but there were certain items in the phase one. When we break them down, to the work package level, some of the work packages may not be clear. We don't really know uh, certain facts about doing that work and we need to wait for some information. We need to wait for some time to that information to reveal. It is just like the uh, pr predictive progressive elaboration situation, but that is not strategic in nature. This is tactical in nature within whatever we have planned in detail, certain areas may not have been planned in detail. Small little areas, like, you know, um, uh, when we will get into, uh, uh, when we get a specific drilling machinery, uh, um, maybe there is a, uh, there might be a risk that that is, machinery is big enough for the tunnel to be accommodated, right? We did not consider that earlier. So now when uh, we, we get to that situation, we will we will have to plan those things further in detail. So this is further elaborating minor details which we have already planned. That is called rolling wave planning. We may say that, okay, this work package is to be done, but I don't have all the details about this work package. So I can wait for this work package uh, and those information to become available as if I can, uh, I can uh, plan it in further details. That would be called our rolling wave planning. Although the concept is very similar, but progressive elaboration was applied at the strategic level, at the project or phase level, but the rolling wave planning is applied at the work package or activity level. So the unknowns, which could be uh, planned later or elaborated later um, within the work packages or activities, could be considered as rolling wave planning and those things which could be considered as strategic in nature for the project, like the things which might get clearer about the project later or the phases later, that could be dealt with uh, the concept of progressive elaboration. Essentially, I do not have any, uh, you know, I don't think that they are any different except for the size. Progressive elaboration, is the same concept at strategic level. Rolling wave planning is the same concept at the tactical level. Do you understand that? And okay, what does it say in the definition? Uh, rolling wave planning is a form of progressive elaboration. I hope you understand as I explained the thing. It is a form of progressive elaboration 
applied at tactical level. What is a tactical level? At the work package, at the planning package, at the release planning. No, at the lower level of planning, we may apply the same philosophy of progressive elaboration, but then because we are doing it at the minute level, at the, so it would not, not be called progressive elaboration. We name it as rolling wave planning. It is both used in adaptive and predictive project, but as I gave you the example of mining project, that was an example of a classic predictive project. In adaptive, you could easily conceive that changes are happening all the time. But uh, in adaptive project, people have difficulty differentiating between the rolling wave planning and progressive elaboration. I would say in an adaptive project, when you were trying to develop a release map and you took certain assumptions and uh, you said, okay, we'll be releasing this, this, this on these dates. Uh, so you could have uh, progressively elaborate as far as the release planning is concerned. But when it comes to the physical, you know, work, which is to happen within the iteration and you have to change your plan according to certain risks, that would be considered as a rolling wave planning. So whatever happens within an iteration and we have to revise the plans uh, within an iteration, that could be considered as a rolling wave planning and whatever happens at the uh, at the uh, at the uh, you know, uh, uh, pro uh, overall project or release level that is more strategic in nature and that would be termed as a progressive elaboration so i prove to you that these two concepts are uh, applicable uh, not only to predictive but to agile project and naturally to the hybrid projects as well so so good so far okay Okay, just hold on. I'll show you a small little video to clarify what is the difference between uh, a minimum viable product and the minimum business increment. Please listen to this very carefully because this is very interesting and very important as far as the agile is concerned. These are terminologies are used there. So please listen to this. There's no sound. No. There is no sound. Okay, let me do it again for you. Oh, sorry. My fault. Let me start it from the beginning. Okay, here it is. One of the cornerstones of Agile is to release incrementally. Build a small but complete piece, release it, learn from it, pivot if needed, and then do it again. But that's not all there is to it. What you build in each of these incremental releases depends on what your objective is. If you're trying to figure out whether a new product or service is viable, you probably should release a minimum viable product. A minimum viable product is often a prototype, where some functionality is simulated or even performed manually. The idea is to do just enough work to get something in front of potential customers and learn what they I'm sorry. Let me get back to the previous slide. I don't know why it breaks, breaks up. One of the cornerstones of Agile is to release incrementally. Build a small but complete piece release it, learn from it, pivot if needed, and then do it again. But that's not all there is to it. What you build in each of these incremental releases depends on what your objective is. If you're trying to figure out whether a new product or service is viable, you probably should release a minimum viable product. A minimum viable product is often a prototype, where some functionality is simulated or even performed manually. The idea is to do just enough work to get something in front of potential customers and learn what they really want. Because a minimum viable product is an investment for discovery. If you're expanding or enhancing an existing product or service, you probably should release a minimum business increment. 
a minimum business increment is the smallest releasable chunk of value that makes sense from a business perspective. A minimum business increment is an investment for revenue. Minimum business increments offer several benefits. They add value for your customers. They help you determine if you're building the right thing. They help you figure out if you're building the right way. They give you a way to determine if what you're building is actually useful. And they enhance your ability to deliver value in the future. Minimum business increments are one of the most useful concepts in Agile, perfect for setting your Agile increment. Okay, do you understand what is it was saying? The two concepts we have got, and uh, uh, we talked about the minimum viable product. That could be a mock-up, like, you know, uh, you asked me to develop a website, and I uh, I am creating the website. While I'm creating it, I uh, maybe the, the main screen, uh, as desired by the customer, I have created that, although it is not hooked to the database, or it is not really, it is just the, just the screen, uh, how will it look like? And I present this mock-up to the customer for approval purposes. Maybe this mock-up is going to be rejected um, or for, for that matter, it is not going to be used in, um, in the final pro product, but still uh, this approval process will be my minimum viable product, right? The customer would have a, a level of satisfaction that I am going in the right direction. They can suggest further improvement. I can improve that again another minimum viable product and ultimately we could come up with the final design of the screen and then we'll hook up the database and other things so at every stage we will keep showing the customer uh, some what value we have generated for them and then they keep approving them or giving them further suggestion so with this we are doing the minimum viable product then is the concept of the uh, minimum business increment that is something of real value delivered to the customer as if they can start using it. They can start earning money out of it while I am doing the project on the sidelines. I am doing the work uh, on the project. Project is yet not complete, but customer is able to earn money out of whatever I have delivered to them. That is minimum business increment. That is a small chunk of business benefit the customer starts getting while the project is going on. I hope you understand these two concepts. Okay, if you got that, then we have got a product roadmap to, to talk about. Uh, you remember in Agile, we said that to start with the Agile pro product, project, we need to have a some kind of a timeline established. What is uh, going to generally happen? What the customer wants? Customer may not be able to define everything in in a very clear term, but you know, generally, what do they want? When do they want it? What is the general timeline of this product delivery? So I must try to develop a kind of an approximation on the pro of the product roadmap when customer needs what, and based on that, the release map can be created. That okay, after three months, customer wants approximately this kind of output they, i mean the, this is the minimum viable product or minimum uh, business increment the customer want at that stage right so uh, i can decide on a timeline in which uh, there are certain stock points where certain value has to be delivered to the customer uh, this might not be a very uh, you know detailed or uh, uh, final requirement this might change but at least this is something we can stand on this could be a foundation although this foundation can change over time because this is an agile project so this is just a way of evolving a big picture envisions and plans the big picture that is a product roadmap it displays the product strategy and direction and the value to be delivered leads with the overarching product vision and uses progressive elaboration to refine vision. So this is just a hazy picture. As we move ahead on this product roadmap, uh, we uh, the things would be clarified. They will be progressively elaborated and we can you know, come up with the, uh, detailed requirements 
add them to the product backlog, tell the team to do things like that. And that's it. Things start rolling out. Things start happening. It uses themes that like goals to provide structure and association, a broad outline goal. Then it provides short-term and long-term visualization. What will be happening in this project in short term, in after one iteration, two iterations, three iterations, or in long run, by the end of the project, what is expected, right? Everything is hazy. In Agile, we don't know exactly. But still, this is product roadmap is kind of a base. We can establish a holistic view how a project is going to roll out. Are you okay with it? Okay. Uh, before I can uh, move forward, uh, I know we are done with the time. Uh, are you guys in a hurry to leave or maybe we can take a little more time if you, you people are not busy elsewhere? Can you spare some time now or we should close right now? Kelvin? First. Mm -hmm. It is first. Like the okay. ladies. Okay, to you want to time. you want to reserve your judgment, right? <laughs> Fasma? Um for how long we are going to stay? Uh maybe fifteen more minutes or something. Yeah, that's okay for me. Okay. Alexandra? That works for me. Okay. And uh, uh, yes, the men. I have nothing, I have nothing <laughs> to say. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, so just 15 more minutes. Thank you for uh, providing me this extra time. Uh, milestones. What are the milestones? Actually, when we create a roadmap, the, uh, the major uh, points in the timeline where something is expected to happen, they would be considered as a milestone. They are the markers of big events, reviews, or due dates, or maybe payments, or decisions. This is, these markers are made on the timeline, and they are called the milestone. They are normally indicating achievement of any one of these things. Any event has happened. Reviews have to be done. This is the due date for something. This is the date for the payment. That time, at that point in time, we may have to make our decision. So all of these, these markers could be milestones, right? Uh, milestones could be uh, kind of uh, uh, specific. They could be specific dates that, okay, on this date, we must have completed this thing. On this date, we must have decided this thing. On this date, the payment must have been made. So milestones are like, uh, like you know, you're traveling on a road and you cross a milestone. So when you cross a milestone, that is the announcement of your achievement that you have traveled these many kilometers, right? So you, it is a specific point in time which you have crossed. So prompts for reporting requirements are sponsor customer approval. Maybe, you know, when a milestone is reached, we, there are linked activities like we have to inform the sponsor or the customer or we have to seek approval from someone. So when this marker is achieved, this milestone is achieved, we can, uh, you know, initiate certain activities which we have already programmed. Then these milestones are basically created by the project manager or the customer, or maybe both of them have mutually set up these milestones. So there is a document which is called a milestone list. It identifies all the possible milestones in the life of the project and indicates which are mandatory and which are optional. Mandatory milestones are kind of, you know, you must abide by them, you can't skip them, and optional are that, okay, these are the milestones, but, you know, it is not obligatory to take any action on them. You may or may not. But mandatory are maybe, they are the contractual requirement to be fulfilled, so they will be definitely mandatory, right? And optional could be that the project manager expects this work to be completed by a specific date, but it may or may not end at that time. This is not a contractual requirement. This was an internal optional milestone set up by the project manager himself or herself, right? 
So the milestones could be mandatory or they could be optional. Okay, when we talk about uh, scope planning, uh, we have to look at it from both the angles, angle of the predictive project management and angle of the agile project management. The approach could be different. And in a hybrid approach, we probably would be doing both sides together. We could be having a project manager looking at the left-hand side and the product owner looking at the agile side. So uh, on the left-hand side, which is the predictive side, what do we do in scope planning? Uh, the project manager is in charge there. Project manager uh, facilitates the collection of requirements before establishing the scope. Because until and unless we are clear about the requirement, until and unless the requirements have been sealed, how can we define the scope? How can we develop a scope statement? And if we don't have a scope statement, we don't have the scope of the product. If we have the scope statement, only then can I further break it down into the project scope. So basically, scope statement does that work. It establishes the product scope and then breaks it down into the project scope. Project scope is uh, how to do it. Product scope is what to do, right? So requirements led, to, led us to the product scope, right? What is to be produced? And then... Uh, we move on to the project scope, how to do it, right? How to meet the product scope, what all actions are to be taken gen gener generally. I'm not talking about the detail plan. I'm just talking about that if you want to construct a wall, you have to have certain basic criteria to establish. So what all work is uh, broadly considered to be done in the construction of a wall, that could be the work breakdown structure telling us the actual activities or work which is to be done. And based on, on, on the product scope and the project scope, only then we can develop the schedule, we can develop the budget, resources, quality plan, everything else comes later. First, we must have a solid scope. Scope must have established. I mean, when I say scope, I need, I, I mean to say requirement must have been established, product scope must have been established and project scope must also have been defined. Only then you can break it down to the lowest level and then start estimation of schedule, budget, resources, cost and so on and so forth. As far as the agile part of it is concerned, product owner is the in charge. He deals directly with the customer. He has the responsibility of creating and refining the release backlog. That is the, uh, I mean, the product, um, uh, what, is, what we said, uh, product uh, roadmap. He was the one who established the product roadmap, right? He was the one who established the product roadmap. He creates the releases out of it. So he develops the release backlog for iteration planning meeting. He explains each prioritized user story in detail to the team. Why? Because he knows it best. He has uh, you know, directly communicated with the customer and understood the requirement from the customer, helped prioritize that requirement with the customer. Now is the time that user story is to be explained to the team as if they can do it. So this is the job of the product owner as far as the scope of an agile project is concerned. He is concerned about the product backlog. He is concerned about the release backlog, uh, sorry, product roadmap, release uh, backlog, release map, and iteration planning will be the responsibility of team. And explaining to the team the user stories is again product owner's business. When it comes to the team, they uh, will pick, uh, choose the task, uh, they, they will choose the relevant user stories they think they can do. So estimates effort required and creates the iteration baseline. So within their iteration, they could create a baseline, they could create a sequence and select the stories to meet the expected velocity. What do they think? How much they can, they can work on 
what is the overall total capacity of the team collectively how much work they can do that is called the expected velocity of the team within an iteration so in with that speed or velocity how many stories could be selected in one iteration and expected to be done this is the job of the team then places user stories from product backlog into the release backlog to support identified features and functions well do not be confused i have already explained to you that we could work the agile team could work directly with the product backlog or if there is a release backlog in between then first the items would be uh, you know transferred to the release backlog that would be concerning only that release not the whole pro uh, project so uh, the product backlog could have been divided into release backlogs right so uh, portions of the product backlog would go to release 1 release 2 release 3 and when it comes to the team uh, in that case if we have a release backlog they will pick the work from the release backlog if we are not working according to the release backlog then they will be picking the work uh, user stories directly from the product backlog so just to clarify i did not want to confuse you on that because sometimes we talk about the product backlog and sometimes we talk about the release backlog so they are interchangeable uh, depending on the situation but ultimately uh, you when you select certain stories either from the product backlog or from the release backlog you bring them into your iteration so there is a iteration backlog where you put these items which we have selected and then we start breaking them down just like in work breakdown structure planning for them just like developing a uh, sequence or developing a schedule in a predictive project but generally speaking we say that we are not going to use the complicated tools of traditional project management of the predictive project management because in agile we keep the things much simpler rather than than using a schedule and a gantt chart and a critical path we do not use that kind of complex environment we use smaller and easier method like you know we can do the um, you know task board task board can serve as a uh, kind of a uh, mini schedule for you because we have only couple of activities to do in one iteration so we don't need to create a very complex system of schedule right so place your story in the product backlog and uh, then use use uses a story map to sequence and prioritize user stories in the release backlog and that's how the things will happen in agile and if you are dealing with a hybrid then pro probably both of these things are happening at higher up the project manager and project sponsor is actually dealing with the left hand side and lower down the product owner product team lead and the team manager team uh, team itself would be dealing with the things on the right hand side so both might be happening in the same project and that could be a hybrid environment so getting starting started uh, with the requirements does this kind of project start with requirements yes please let's take the example of the of the uh, case study slc shop project does it start with some kind of requirements yes okay if your answer is yes then you are talking about a predictive project requirements are elicited and set at the beginning of the project if your answer is sort of maybe some of it that means user stories are a different way of thinking about the requirement process like we are talking about agile and maybe is a hybrid environment where uh, we elicit and refine requirement or compose user stories so lower down we are doing the user stories and uh, higher up we are doing a kind of a predictive approach requirements what are they and why do we need them i probably have already explained it to you that there is a requirement management to be done before we can establish the product scope and the project scope so uh, i said that requirement management uh, may be considered a part of scope management otherwise 
Requirement management is in itself a huge discipline. In business analysis, requirement management is a separate discipline. But in project management, uh, naturally, the business analyst has already done the requirement analysis. So uh, we make it part of scoping as if we can translate the requirement into product scope and then to the project scope. But still, project manager has to has to get involved in some kind of requirement management. A requirement is one single measurable statement of a condition or capability. That is, you uh, for uh, under, uh, undertaking a project, for completing a project, you have to meet several requirements. There might be 10 different requirements, which if completed, the project will be considered complete. It could be just like a KPI. If these are 10 requirements, if they are done, then your project will be considered as done, right? So it tells how a product service or result satisfies a specific business need. So it is also associated with the uh, alignment with the strategy or the business need. And that tells us that these requirements, if fulfilled, the business need will be fulfilled. Guidelines for use could be start at a high level before providing details. So first uh, divide the project into maybe phases, then phases into further sub parts of it. And ultimately you can go down to the detail level must be unambiguous specifically in a predictive project when you're talking about we try to make things very clear even if they are not clear we still try to establish uh, the requirements in a unambiguous terms like you know we establish a scale to measure it how to test it how to trace these requirements how to complete these requirements uh, how to see the consistency of these requirements and acceptability by the key stakeholders. All of this thing is part of your requirement analysis. So I think uh, we should leave here and I have introduced you to the what, what is a requirement from the predictive point of view. We will continue from here. We have done 18 slides of lesson number three. So uh, next class, uh, we will be having a three hour class uh, on Monday. And in that I will start from slide number 19. This is the requirement document requirement, which is called requirement traceability matrix. I'll talk about it. Just remember that. And if you have any questions so far, uh, you can ask. Yes, anyone? Perfect. Fine. Fatma? Alexandra? No, no questions. Okay. All requirement fine. Do you have requirement traceability metrics in Agile project? Uh, not required at all. Not required okay. at all. We don't okay. have any detailed requirement, so we don't need that. Okay. Right. So let's call it a day. Thank you very much for your company and giving me an extra time. I'm also sorry for starting late. So I tried to make up in these 15 minutes for that lost 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much and take care. It's okay. See you. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.